So I'm going to go over my notes, my extrapolations from the Cognitive Remediation Conference. And there wasn't very much hopeful stuff from the day from my own perspective, but I did write pages upon pages upon pages of extrapolations. So I feel like babbling on about it like a crazy person and putting it in terms of my context. And again, I didn't make notes about the content they said as much as epiphenomenon of insights and ideas that arose in consciousness as a result of what they were saying. And I don't think I'm going to be too coherent with this in terms of trying to make it linear. I just want to put voice to the things that I wrote down, to give voice to them, not so much to try to make sense of it in retrospect, because to me, that's a similar process that is happening. People observing stuff, trying to make sense of it, putting it in a neat little package, and then putting that understanding onto people. And this what I'm going to share is my understanding that arose that isn't necessarily linear based on what they were saying because they were giving a linear program but my mind was having insights which aren't linear. So I will read it in the non-linear insight order that I wrote down and there's a lot of it so I'm going to babble on and see how this goes. And when I first got there, I did encounter a book called Awakening the Tiger or something by Peter Levine. And in the beginning of the book, I opened it up and it had a passage from a Gnostic gospel that says, If you bring forth that which is within you, then that which is within you will be your salvation. If you do not bring forth that which is within you, then that which is within you will destroy you. And I think that it is a sign about sharing self-dialogue and also other stuff too. But that was a cool little synchronicity sign encouragement from the universe. And I'm probably going to buy that book on Kindle and read it. And I don't think that my babbling here will sound any less coherent than the clip that I included of the one presenter talking and I started counting and this person said the word schizophrenia four times, illness five times, symptoms three times, relapse twice, patience, voices, delusions, cognitive this and that so many times in a very short period of time and that really set the tone for the day which was very much a pathology-based, illness-based, something is wrong with this person and we need to do something to them to fix them attitude. And it's that very attitude that is destructive in that it doesn't build relationships. It's not based on trust. It's based on the one who knows more, not asking and building relationship. And by the end of the day, it became a fact that they did not in any way, shape, or form, attribute any fault of these cognitive deficits or declines to the medication treatments themselves. They didn't mention that at all, even though, in my mind, it was a big, huge pink elephant in the room. And I feel that in some of these states of consciousness, the brain is in fight or flight flight and trauma mode, and when the brain is in this cortisol fight or flight mode, I shared studies before that the brain cannot learn. And part of cognition is learning and recognizing patterns and how can the brain do it when it is in trauma mode. And the other thing with the trauma mode is it makes anything that could potentially be traumatic in one's reality very salient. And there are a lot of invisible traumatic things that we don't necessarily sense on a daily basis, but if we're 
traumatized or we have a huge allostatic load of stress built up, we're going to recognize those things and not want to participate. And another point I made to myself is that the current mode of cognition of humanity is much of what is destroying the world. And if we were at one time participating in this world and then experienced trauma or had something happen for some kind of distress to come about that gets interpreted by psychiatry as a mental illness, then the brain has trouble then participating in that world because that world is that which damaged the brain. So it's hard for a damaged brain by that world to want to then again participate in the world. So at the same time, it's not safe for the new brain algorithm to come online. So it was all illness-based language and making the assumption of illness. And as I've read from movements like Hearing Voices, on their guidelines for their group, it says make no assumption of illness. A lot of people who identify as voice hearers do not identify with having a problem or an illness. And I am similar in that I don't identify with having a mental illness. I don't identify with any way of interpreting it, and that's why I create many ways each day of understanding it, and not understanding it, but understanding life, the complexity, and learning, and learning that I can make up my own understanding, drop it, not operate on any kind of belief or continuity or linearity. And that's part of what happens in map consciousness is we don't operate as much based on belief and linearity. And then that's thought of as a mental illness because in society we value consistency and we fear inconsistency. And so I mentioned that they said schizophrenia so many times and cognitive declines at the beginning of the illness. And they use this as proof that the, it's part of the illness because it happens at the beginning of the illness. But a person having a panic attack or a traumatic episode would not have cognition the same way as people who are in a safe mode of consciousness. So to me, it's entering that traumatic mode. And of course, cognition goes offline because the brain is experiencing trauma. But then what happens with the medications is it freezes the brain in that state of not being able to deal with the trauma. And so it then freezes the brain in a state of having less cognition so it was interesting that they use that as proof because, of course, my cognition changes when I'm having a distress event, but it comes back, especially because I've never agreed to be on long-term antipsychotics. And in the beginning of the day especially, just hearing the professionals talk about people like us in these ways literally made me feel ill. It made me feel nauseous. They also said things like clozapine is an underutilized treatment, cognitive losses, and they said they released a book called Cognitive Remediation to Improve Functional Outcomes. And this is just such disjointed and inhumane cold language. The tone of the conference really was that we are functional outcomes or problems to be fixed and productivity. It's like, just get back to work. Just go be a part of the economy like you were trained to be during your educational years. What if an outcome was that we got to live our dreams, not function? And they mentioned that there are well-researched cognitive losses and that clinicians are not learning this. 
and that they need to educate clinicians about it. So not only will we now be told that we have this mental illness for life, we'll also be told that we have cognitive losses. So it's a double devastation. And it's devastating to be labeled with that. And it basically tells a being to stop learning, stop trying to live life, and you won't live much of a life. And now we'll be told about cognitive losses. And this sort of messes up with their biochemical imbalance theory. How does this fit into it? And then I learned that one of the doctors there was one of the people involved in creating the mental health acts for involuntary treatment. And that kind of energy being in the room was just awful. Not all provinces have mental health acts that have involuntary chemical incarceration, but mine does. And I wrote down that we need to create the way out of how we are interpreted and funneled by professionals and also how they program our families. And they call this psychoeducation. They program our families to use the same languaging on us, like lack of insight and all these things, as they use on us. And then our family looks at us just as psychiatry would. And I don't know if this is family's fault or is just the way they're programmed. And I'm not necessarily debating whether cognitive remediation works or not. What I'm saying is using illness-based language is not nice and not admitting to the effects of the medications and how they cause brain shrinkage, they cause cognitive decline. They even at one point said people with schizophrenia have weight problems and high cholesterol and didn't even say that was from the antipsychotics. So they didn't say anything. They're not admitting any iatrogenic effects of these medications. And later in the day, they went as far as saying, oh, we're looking into medications that might help the, clog the cognitive declines. Anyways, on to the next bit. I did appreciate learning about cognition and also something that I thought of was how the cognition of our prefrontal co cortex, and I've talked about this before, is largely programmed, conditioned, and contrived. These ways of thinking and our thoughts are programmed into us. We didn't come up with them ourselves. So it's a false structure of programming. So when that breaks down, we're assuming that that's really a real structure and that it's not based on the way society has been built and as if this society that we've built is the only way to build a society because I feel that the brain is opting out of society because it sees where society is going. And there is a new functionality of the brain. There's a new cognition that right now the environment isn't the proper soil for it to flower. It's not safe for that to come online yet. And a point made was that we focus on getting rid of things like symptoms and not really doing things to gain cognition. And a scary thing they presented was between 1889 and the present day, within a 10 mile radius in New York, I think it was, there was 50,000 people in institutions. Now there's only 896 inpatients left. But how many people are chemically incarcerated? And they talked about how some people have difficulty with drive and experiencing pleasure. And so many of our lives are based and designed on pleasure. And this again is a false structure. 
And also, if people have experienced somebody taking power over us to gain pleasure, we might ourselves decouple from pleasure because we see that the, there is damage done by that type of outlook. And when we're looking around for pleasure, then we use people for pleasure and the brain decouples from that somewhat. And part of this new cognition and part of this whole process is that our heart is broken and our heart is part of cognition and so is our body. If we're holding a certain posture, that's going to affect our cognition, our way of thinking. And the heart sends seven times the information to the brain, then vice versa. So if the heart is in fight or flight, there's something to that. And to me, trauma changes our inner rules. And again, they said that since the cognitive declines are present at first episode, it's not a result of the medication. Even though there are studies that these medications shrink the brain on a long-term basis. And I think they keep people stuck in this trauma and numbing out to the trauma. But it's still there. And they did a little exercise to demonstrate that people with so-called schizophrenia have trouble remembering the source of their memory, whether someone else said it or whether they said it. And this is a little silly in my mind because most of what people think and say they got from someone else, but they think that they thought of it themselves or they're saying it themselves. So to me... Being confused about who came up with what might actually be closer to the truth that we didn't come up with anything ourselves. And it also points to the fact that our brain is more in the mirror neuron system where when we see someone wave or we wave ourselves, the brain doesn't know the difference. So to me, we're more at the level of the knowing of the brain and this also speaks to anything we do to someone else, we do to ourselves. The brain doesn't know the difference. And as children, we learn more by mirroring. And if we're more in a mirror system, if we're received with love and care and gestures of caring relatedness, then that will help to bring our brain back online. If we realize something's being done to us, it's going to keep the status quo of the brain not coming back online. So there is no such thing as my own thought. And when we're told you have this mental illness label, say schizophrenia, by somebody, and then later on we say, I have this mental illness label, schizophrenia, Who really said that? We didn't think of that ourselves. But then later on, when we feel like we thought of that ourselves or we take that on as our own, then psychiatrists are happy. So to me, what it shows is a brain in this vulnerable state is easy to be programmed into thinking that it does have some kind of mental illness because it might at some point pretty much think that it thought of it itself when we've been hypnotized into feeling and thinking these things. We didn't come up with that ourselves. That's not how we would interpret ourselves if we never heard that word or anything about it. So to me, this is closer to the truth, breaking down the myth that we thought of something ourselves and it wasn't programmed into our brain by somebody else saying it to us. A traumatized brain doesn't want to participate in this world. And interestingly enough about cognitive remediation, where it's mostly done on a computer, if there's no therapist there, the treatment, as it's called, isn't effective. And again, this shows the power of relationship. If there's relationship there, genuine relationship, nearly anything is going to be effective in my mind. It's the power of relationship. 
They did a trial where people did 40 hours of cognitive remediation with no therapist, and they didn't improve at all in quality of life or role functioning, even though cognition went up. And they talked about how the cognitive decline and functional decline precedes psychosis. And to me, this shows that the education system and the way the world is designed is destroying the human brain. Some people are not able to adapt or adopt these cognitively contrived cognitive structures. And the only thing they ever mentioned as outcomes or examples of somebody's goal were work or school. They never said anything else but work or school, as if we're functions of work and functions of school. And they mentioned that when cognition goes down 0.5 standard deviations, it equals 7.5 drop in IQ points, so tasks feel harder. And I was relating this to how sometimes things feel a lot easier when that creative energy comes in and I can get a lot more done time feels like it slows down. So it sounds like cognitive remediation is to go back to being a cog in the machinery of society. And again, somebody mentioned lack of insight, and that's why I'm sharing all my insights as, in my mind, others lack insight as to what it's like to live with insight and the ability to see beyond thought. And families don't want to see that they're part of this. The brain is an organ of creativity and learning and education destroys this and replaces it with false cognition. So when we learn for ourselves, see things for ourselves and we're creative, we are in alignment with the functioning of the human brain. And they mention that we need evidence-based care from a qualified professional And to me, this is because we don't know what it means to be human beings or how to relate as human beings. We are human machines. And somebody mentioned a dealing with psychosis toolkit. How about being with psychosis and transforming through psychosis? And there was a mention of how half the people with bipolar are below 80% of the general population in cognition and they don't have active symptoms. And I feel that has to do with a different emergent functioning of the brain, which is perception, action, not mediated by thought or the intermediary contrivances that have been programmed into us that lead us to abstract and project patterns to operate based on, which is what cognition is. There is no middleman. There's no thought. It's perception, action. So it bypasses a lot of the cognitive structures. Give somebody with bipolar, supposed bipolar, a creative task, and you'll be blown away. And... Apparently, executive function has something to do with the ability to organize, prioritize information. And all of this is conceptual, which again is from memory and programmed into us. And part of what is happening in these other emergent brain neural tribes is we're not operating based on concepts. And all of life is designed to be based on concepts and actual life is not according to our human concepts. And when I took Seroquel in March, because I was experiencing some distress, I could barely work on the computer. I could barely focus. I was trying to do a task and I kept screwing it up. It was confusing. It was hard. It was challenging. And they say, or they didn't mention anything about these medications interfering with functioning and cognition. They blame that part on the illness, as they call it. And dreams heal the nightmare. So if you want to help your loved one participate in their dreams, and there's something about heart cognition and embodied cognition. And 
I feel one of the reasons why a lot of people experience depression when they go into post-secondary education is the brain senses it all as meaningless. And equating functioning with being a human, do we really know what human functioning is? The universe knows we don't need our brains for memory anymore. And when we don't waste the energy of the brain on recall of memory to project onto the present moment, we have more energy because seeing and being in contact with the moment now creates energy. But the universe needs to make sure we will use these new capacities for good, in quotes, for the good of all. But it doesn't have to make sure of this because perception and action with the moment is congruent and co coherent and thus can only produce what is congruent and coherent. And if we were all doing this, we would create a different world. Look what human cognition is doing to the world and others. This personal motivation and pleasure and the current contrived cognitive structures. I wonder what would happen if families took hearty nutritionals first so they could prepare to adequately move through distress with their loved one and resolve it at the root of it in daily life dancing out with their family and meeting each moment together and allowing what needs to heal to play out in the dynamics of family life as opposed to family members looking at the one that has all the problems and trying to do something to fix that person. Is it possible that the whole family can transform through one supposed family member having a supposed psychosis? Other family members are struggling too. Can the whole fabric be healed? Not dealing with and not trying to do something to fix. Can we upgrade our operating system instead of try to fix the old operating system? Maybe cognition as we know it is meant to break down. Maybe there's an upgrade. We wouldn't try to fix old operating systems on our phone. Why would we do this in our brain? Suffering damages the brain, but perhaps this brain damage eventually leads to a new operating system. And I wonder if we should create a fund, a new fund for people to save for their own mental health services, because there's a good chance that one day they will have a crisis, a breakdown, and be funneled into the current system, which nobody would wish upon anybody. All of this society pays for the brain damage induced by society. In this recent crisis I had that was distressful, that went on for about two weeks, as the distress went up, I couldn't think and function as much. But without the medications mediating it, and with the help of the micronutrients, I could think my way through it. The meds block the trauma, but it's still there. And then the difference is we can't actually meet it in order to think our way through it. We think it's symptoms of a mental illness, so then we drug it and we don't meet it. And what I experienced was having some strange thoughts and ideas, but the ability to see that it wasn't true. But if there's medications in my system, it would make it more difficult to see that it's not true. Because the medication is just numbing out the whole process of being aware moment to moment. And when we're aware of it and seeing that it's not true, as that goes on, I feel that the memories are filed in their proper place. And given ecphoric sensation, by virtue of 
each distressing idea or thought or possible belief that comes up, seeing that it's not true, by seeing it, it gets filed away as that's not true anymore. But if we can't see it and meet it, it builds up and builds up and turns into beliefs and turns into hallucinations and projections, and then we're running away from things as if they're true. Because we don't know what's true. Whereas if we're not drugged out and we can meet it, we can see that it's not true. And they mentioned how an executive function is time management. And for me, I feel like time isn't something to be managed, but created with. And when we're in the mode of creativity, the subjectivity of time changes. We feel like we have a lot more time and we don't need to manage it. So it's a different way of being with time and seeing that the mode that our brain is in changes how we create the experience of time passing. And so creativity makes time pass slower. Things seem easier. We get a lot more done. The opposite in a way is depression where time drags on. Everything feels harder. So it's kind of like molasses. So what I'm saying is part of a solution is creativity and learning and playing. And cognitive remediation seems to be meaningless drills that get the brain oriented back to a meaningless life in the meaningless old functionings that it's very challenging to get the brain to readopt. And they say that we have motivation problems. Well, what is a motive? It's a movement away from the moment. And can we move away from this idea of cognition to one of creating energy of consciousness? The energy of consciousness of learning and seeing how the universe responds when we do this. And when we're not doing this, the whole universe responds with a swarm of psychiatry. If we start to gesture that we want to learn and understand for ourselves, the universe will participate with that process. And they talked about an uneducated workforce and how if the workforce doesn't know about cognitive remediation, they won't get any referrals. And that made me think about how they've educated the whole community and society about mental illness, supposed mental illness through anti-stigma campaigns and things like that. So everyone in the community knows to refer their friends and family to psychiatry if anything like that shows up. The new cognition is heart-based and holistic. The heart and the body doesn't lie, but the brain sure can. Can we mediate this through the heart? Can we reconnect with our heart? Something happened that we weren't okay with, and now more is happening that we aren't okay with in terms of being pathologized by psychiatry. My learning is way faster than I can talk about. How do we use our strengths to overcome society? And memory limits us. Can we design an environment that's visual? Where there's nothing in drawers. And creativity and learning will happen. Can the brain grow back into creativity and learning instead of functioning as a cog which is programmed for us to be functional cogs in the machine? Advocate for tapering strategies and medication reduction and be prepared for life unmodified and unmodulated. There are supposed cognitive declines that are temporary when we're in distress as the brain is busy processing distress, this temporary distress is medicalized, pathologized, psychiatrized, labeled, and medicated, and turned into a lifelong problem. Can creativity, which is even higher level than executive functioning, heal trauma? Is trauma and the way that the brain survives it part of creativity?
being told how to interpret one's experience as an illness gets rid of thinking about it and figuring it out for ourselves, which stops learning. The labeling process stops us from learning and understanding. If we were in dialogue to continue to learn about this structure of our life, Day by day, we wouldn't have stopped learning, and our cognition would be just fine. Can we share what we think is happening today for us? Can we allow it to change the next day or the next minute? Why does it have to be consistent? Why does it have to be one thing or one story? Why can't we think up things for ourselves? People can think for themselves and think together and not along a certain line. The problem to begin with is thinking along a certain line, which creates beliefs. There's nothing to be believed. Belief has nothing to do with the present moment now. Goals are related to pleasure, dopamine, and motivation, whereas there's something else that is a driver, which is meaning and context of which we can create ourselves. Goals, pleasure, and dopamine, those are projections that we then approximate in order to get a hit of dopamine and can we allow people to say things and feel safe and not be judged can they say things without us interpreting it as behavior and then shipping people off to the psych ward because it's out of character and this creates a fear of being banished but we're banished to psychiatry and can we move from thinking in terms of productivity to thinking in terms of creativity? I've never stopped trying to figure this out. The word just can be changed to possibility. And I feel that refusing to be on daily antipsychotics is what has saved me. The brain is for learning, so destroying its basic capacity through the use of psychopharmaceuticals leads to a life of meaninglessness. But our basic capacity to learn is destroyed through education, which leads to an accumulated feeling of meaninglessness over time, as the main meaning of the brain is to understand, to make meaning for itself, not live in approximation to life by projecting ready-made meanings from its memory bank. The brain is not sick, but it's sick of this society. Therefore, we must create a new society as we who have dropped out can see what has 